Good morning, I'm CJ Reynolds. I'm a research associate at the uh, College of Marine Science at the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg. I'm also the executive director of the International Ocean Institute USA, which is a, a small organization that works on ocean policy. My role there is uh, working on stakeholder engagement programs uh, with organizations, with civic organizations, environmental awareness, and municipalities. Uh, a range of issues spanning from uh, climate change, sea level rise, to my favorite topic, which is preventing marine and aquatic debris. And I'm really uh, excited to be here to uh, share a lot of information uh, with you today. The first rule of thumb, is, as you all know, is to find out who your audience is. And although you did introduce yourself, I want to ask, how many of you uh, develop uh, materials or give talks that could potentially involve some information about preventing litter. Awesome, that's exciting. So the rest of you, I guess you can take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking, because actually I think some of the things we'll cover today will also apply to a variety of other environmental education topics um, from preservation and conservation of spaces and lands. So um, thanks for so, um, I think the reason I'm really here is because in 2014, uh, we received uh, one of the NOAA Marine Debris Prevention through Education and Outreach Grants, which we entitled Clean Community and Clean Coasts, Empowering Youth Teachers and Volunteers to Prevent Marine Debris. We thought long and hard about the title of that, um, which is really meant to be benefit-driven and focusing first on where is it that we felt we needed to clean up to ultimately benefit and create the clean coast. We also felt um, very similar to what the previous speaker addressed, was that there were people who just might not care about the environment, but they would care about their clean community. And, and we thought that this would be sort of ideologically and politically neutral. Who can argue with clean community? And that's what we were seeking when we created the program. It's a, it's a robust program. It's still giving me heartburn at many levels. So, um, and I'm happy to share any aspects about the strategies or the larger scope of it, you know, or any microscopic details that you want to talk about later um, in, in the conversation. So there's five key objectives. So many, many are very, you know, consistent with a lot of environmental education programs that you've probably created yourself. I think one of the things that really wanted for us was the two part. Number one, stimulate public awareness to large scale art installations made from marine debris. And three, identify factors that facilitate a shift in attitudes and litter disposal behaviors in specific contexts. Uh, and that was really key to, to uh, some of the root causes of what I saw were marine debris coming from inland community trash. The grant team is enormous and full of a variety of diverse expertise, and that was necessary. And I think also all of you can recreate this within your own community. Uh, we have the scientists and the environmental expertise. We have uh, science educators. We have college behavior community science, people who understand behavior, but they were used to really looking at behavior and community issues from a perspective of poverty and alcohol and youth issues and that sort of stuff. So they brought a different level of um, looking at behaviors and stuff that we hadn't really thought about before. Um, artists, embodied artists, uh, energy studios, Tampa Bay Watch was our really, our, our environmental space collaborator and Keith Pinnell is beautiful. And I just have to give a shout out to all of the uh, county affiliates in Florida. I and mean, there's a lot of good work that they've done. I guess I've actually been a fan of Keep America Beautiful. There's over 600 affiliates. Uh, around the country, and there's probably one in many of our coastal counties and inland counties that we can do collaborate. They, they do a great job of organizing the troops to get into the communities to adopt shores, adopt roads, and everything else like that. So, um, and we have many, many unfunded collaborators. Um, for some of you who are in the municipal sector, uh, parks and recreation, engineering, stormwater, very, very big supporters who actually didn't want funding because they didn't want to deal with all the paperwork. They wanted to work with us on all the outreach because it dovetailed with municipal stormwater uh, requirements regarding outreach, and they wanted to know what worked and how they can improve their own stuff. So the first part was to um, kick off the project, and, and our key challenge was how to make litter interesting. It's an old topic, it's all you know, boring, it's preaching, so how do we make our 
uh, that are interesting, and the artists were the ones who really had the big idea, of course, <laughs> um, they had uh, proposed to create a very large sculpture, which is called Current Collections. It's 38 by 40 feet. You can stand underneath it. You get a sense of the scale. So these steel beams um, are swirling as a water vortex, and it's wrapped with plastic parts and, and recycled and reclaimed plastic bags from various uh, cleanup activities in the community, which then uh, through the engagement, which is STEAM, meaning it's the STEM plus art is that new mashup of words there, uh, STEAM powered community engagement, not really STEAM, um, where they coordinated workshops with the DALI Museum, uh, Museum of Fine Arts, uh, the public libraries, where they basically just got the space. The, the museums were so excited to do this. But we had art making activities where basically kids would cut out plastic parts and then they would bring it over and then you know the adults would sort of heat press it and then these parts were then later uh, heat pressed and transferred onto larger panels uh, and the chicken wire and basically wrapped around the sculpture. So the kids were very excited about it and there was probably several thousand of them over the communities that would come through this. So it was a way of hands on art making plus the artists were all um, you know, sort of learn how to talk the talk about learning degree and, and all the messages that went along with that. So that's huge, and, and I wouldn't advise anyone trying to do this at home. But if you do have space, public art, you want to engage public arts. And there's a lot of people who will donate money to build art that may not consider environmental education important. So it's another way for you to uh, look for funding opportunities. I couldn't believe, I mean, it just opened the door. We were all just astonished. We're like, hey, what is this every year? And we're like, oh my god, no. Um, <laughs> permitting and, and licensing and safety and security and FAA regulations. There's a airport in there. So, uh, just you know, you're going to think about that. I'll give you the shit, the checklist of things to think about. <laughs> So the artists uh, themselves live in Atlanta. They were very excited uh, to do more stuff. After they built that thing, I thought, maybe they're done. And they're like, no, I don't love this. They approached the Georgia Aquarium, uh, who then, um, they worked together on a science festival project and World Ocean Day project, um, and another a group of these uh, sort of youth hands-on, so you can see different bags that are woven. Um, Tampa Bay Wash shipped a bunch of monofilament line that they had recycled, and, uh, nasty nets and the artists cleaned it, and that's actual reclaimed marine debris from uh, the Tampa Bay region, uh, in which they strung up and, and strung across one of the large tanks, which really bothered people, which I thought was very ironic. I mean, you didn't see, and we're like, that's the point. Invention <laughs> <laughs> of this. So the artist, this is actually a smaller scale compared to the big sculpture, but it's something if you have tanks or other things that you could envision doing this. Um, within your own uh, organization, bringing on some artists who'd like to do these things and work with kids. One of the important things, as you know, um, as educators, is the signage that you create. Um, particularly with art, it can't just stand by itself. Some people say it should, and it actually it does. But when you're trying to convey environmental information with it, it's important to it. So we had uh, three signs that were explained it, the grant, and what it was doing, and, and all the sponsors, the usual sort of stuff. Uh, when we went to Atlanta, we was featured in Centennial Park for a month. Um, the Chattahoochee River Keepers up there were another sort of unfunded volunteer group that just were like, oh, we love this, we want to be a part of it. And, and we had talked a lot about you know, the problem with storm drains and trash traveling, and this was really the prevention side, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, they were so excited about that they, they created a new poster, which um, was new for them in terms of how they were uh, communicating and visualizing this to their audiences. And it was great for us and our project as well. And so, really, a simple um, uh, power part, excuse me, a simple uh, poster size. It's about 24 by 24, which informs people how uh, storm drains, you know, basically flow into waterways. And most people, okay, I'm going to just say, uh, even five years ago, never knew it really. I mean, those things go somewhere, and people clean up like little dwarves or special elves or <laughs> magic, again, the magic uh, cleans out the uh, storm drains and there's trash in it. You know, I didn't really connect it until I moved to Tampa and saw, wow, oh, there's stuff on that street comes into my pond. Oh, that so the knowledge, but most people just don't understand how civil engineering works and municipal storm water treats work. You explain it to them and they go, oh, really? They catch it, doesn't need a clean 
somewhere, but they'd send guys to do that. So it's important to explain the process to prevent it, uh, your personal role, and the consequences. So when I, I meet lots of people who don't care about the environment, and I say, you know, it costs a lot of money for us, for our taxpayer dollars, to send um, a municipal crew to go clean up that bin. Wouldn't you like to prevent that and use that for something else? So um, I see a, a question in the back. Yes? I was just going to say, I just moved back here from uh, Atlanta after being there for 10 years with the National Wildlife Federation. And I did a lot of work with the Riverkeeper crew. And, you know, so there's so many opportunities here in Southwest Florida to develop kayakers so they can go to the trails uh, and that kind of thing. And it's just a matter of getting together volunteers and going out. I mean, I've been out on some of those um, trash collected, trash, trash collected, uh, Gals and we do sections at a time, maybe like two, two miles, something like that. But we collect tons of trash. I mean, you go back, they, you know, like six months later, and there are 50 new tires that you didn't find, you know, the last time, and things like that. So yeah. it's a very easy thing to do, it's just a matter of what you're going to do. Right, so the comment was essentially that these volunteer groups and, and many of us in the room are. are uh, it's necessary to keep our you know, volunteers excited about doing this because the trash is never ending when you're talking about community trash. Thanks for that comment. So now we get to the part of the grant which is pretty complicated and it's a, you know, changing literary behavior. So my, my, you know, our, our question was like, is it really possible to change anybody's behavior? Get anyone to change anything? You think about diets or running or uh, anything you want to do. But so I, I saw these two cartoons and they were Dogs picking up after people. It might be easier to train the dogs. <laughs> so, the, the first and most important thing that um, we want to understand, uh, and you've probably heard this before, but I think it bears focusing on in terms of debris and litter prevention issues, is that litter is a complicated series of behaviors and decisions that exist within the sites and activities and events. It's not just like this extra sort of amorphous thing of litter. It's very specific to groups of people, site and social uh, context. And so we start with the idea of social norms, uh, that are beliefs which are held by people, groups, teams, types of different audiences, that influence the perceptions and behaviors of any given context. And the perception of what other people are doing does influence people to behave similarly. And the awareness of consequences also does influence behavior. And I wanted to mention briefly that a site itself has its own sort of social norm. Mm, okay, let's think about a library. Social norm in there. If I go running in there, go blah blah blah, blah you know, no. A church, all right. Uh, different contexts of uh, let's see, a bar. Completely different social norms going on, right? Uh, the aspect of understanding how a site, how your site. Or sites. So what is the perception of the person? The other thing is that people drag their culture and their social norms with them wherever they go. So there's a confluence of things going on you have to factor out. Um, it, there's a the nature center down in Key Biscayne. I can't think of the name. Marjorie Stoneman. Famous. Yeah, it's a great place. They, they bring in like 200 kids from uh, Miami-Dade every day for nature trips and, and school visits. And the kids are coming from the city, you know, and, and they don't necessarily get to the water. So the whole expectation of experience, teaching them how to behave and how to engage the space is all a part of it. So, okay, so we got a little aspects of urban there. Sorry, I know some of you may not be working in a really urban context where we got a stadium, we got a park, we got a bus stop. Festival, that's a real festival, or what's happened after it. So what, what do you think might be some of the contributing uh, social norms that would, were behind the, the you know, outcomes of this? Any thoughts? Disposable water bottles. Yeah, I'm thirsty, I got a drink now. Don't want to carry stuff around. Somebody else will clean it up. Ding, 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 it. So, so it's something that leads to social events, particularly large public gatherings. So if you have them, you know what to expect, right? It's a party! I'm not working, I'm on duty, my mind is elsewhere, I am not being responsible. 
Uh, or it's someone else's job to clean it up. I've actually heard this over and over again from movie theaters <coughs> to, um, conf to conference events to all kinds of things. I want to take that person's job. That's why they're hired to clean up after me. Yeah, so I've actually heard that it's a labor issue. I was like, oh. <laughs> everyone else is doing it. Like peer pressure, right? If I can't, I shouldn't pick up because they're all trashy. What I call selective blindness. Trash? What trash? I don't see no sneaking trash here. This also is a reflection of where you grew up or what you're used to in your own neighborhood and home and cultural environment. So I lived in some uh, pretty tough neighborhoods in Chicago and yeah, I don't see no trash. And then now you come down and you're like, oh, look at that dirt in my street. You know, my neighbors are there with tweezers picking things up. So there's a consciousness as where you come from. So I learned how to be like them and now I go around the people who live. Um, in these larger social events, alcohol often plays a factor. Well, that's no surprise. But in most of your places, you probably the alcohol is probably not allowed. Is it still being consumed? Hmm, that could be a factor. So I would say, even if it's not allowed, take it into consideration that it is being it is a factor to someone. Why not? I go to the beach. I see it. I'm always like, I think the cops are looking to see it too. So. I'm going to just take a minute to go around the room and ask some of you guys to volunteer. What sort of littering behaviors have you seen in your sites? And what were the, what do you think were the sort of social norms, what was going on in their head at the time? If you have that um, telepathic power, so you want to know. The back. Um, some of our 5Ks through a preserve, uh, we've had folks pick up a water bottle from the water bottle station and then walk, you know, run three feet and just get to the mangroves. And, you know, the trash can is right there, but don't have the time. I'm, I'm on the clock. So special event with runners. They're in the healthy, they're, they're, they, they're busy. So the social norm is I'm busy, and someone else is going to pick up after me. Because when I run in other places in urban events, people will sweep up after me. So that's a great point. Thanks for that. Any other ideas? Central? Smokers on beaches. Oh, smokers on beaches. Why do we litter? Well, you know, those butts are biodegradable, you know. It looks like paper. I think it is, so I'll just stick it out here. Butts are a big issue. What's your idea? So I've experienced cleaning up cars lately, and, and I find alcohol bottles, beer bottles left over. That's the party. Okay. Beer bottles, alcohol left over. Yes, so people just can't see the bottles after they've consumed a few. I suspect. Any other? In those parks and uh, secluded areas, that's also where the ho homeless may congregate with their alcohol and bottles and bags. You can just leave it for them for choice. Right. So access to uh, bins is also a big issue. I'm going to talk about that because facility design is a key contributor or detractor or barrier to littering behaviors. One last one. Magic Kingdom, believe it or not, people still throw trash on the ground even though they think those cute little custodian people are going to come behind them. So we actually hired put an entertainer with a safari hat on, walking around with, and having little kids come around the other and somebody, oh, I think you dropped something, and they got the kids, which shame the parents, which... <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's a lot of commonality to this, and, and if this is one thing you take away from this is that there's a lot of uh, social norms where we perceive that other people will take care of stuff. So if we could all, wherever we are, in whatever work and jobs and, and outreach and consumer component we do, just start to, I mean, this starts with the kids, but it starts with every single environment. So as you know, frequency of advertising message, is just, it says that that's what it's going to take to succeed. So if all of us get on the same bandwagon, consistent and positive, um, then I think we can start to, to change some. I think there's rainbows and unicorns too. So... Um, <laughs> I wanted to share some insights from the youth focus groups that we've done now, uh, seven of them with middle school students um, in after school programs, summer camps, and uh, in school class time, which were facilitated by our behavior people. So we gave them the background on the environmental component, we gave them just some generic literary thing. We didn't want to bias our behavior researchers because, you know, we really should see them say it this way, you know, and then it comes out wrong. So, um, what we really found was, um, among some of the sort of standard like perceptions you would expect kids to have about littering, is that the biggest challenges, the 
that we will have as environmental educators is the adults that they circulate with and the site conditions really influence their perceptions, like superstars there, of what is acceptable. So the notion, and, and this was at the litter at the school and the grounds, if they see that if there's any dirt or stuff, the litter begets litter. It's just like, okay, that's acceptable. Teachers litter, they bring it to it. They went on and on. Oh, she's a slob. Oh, he brings this stuff. I see him eating in his car and he throws the paper on the ground. So, so the notion, if you want to reach kids, you have to go to the school and get the entire school on board and all the faculty and the groundskeeper. Oh, we walked down the hall and then, you know, I was thinking, you know, they do the trash ball and it doesn't get in there, and, but they, you know, the principal doesn't reprimand them. They don't say, pick that up. So there isn't the conscious culture to say, keep it clean, folks. It's a part of our good, being good citizens here and, and strong students. Big issues. It was just hilarious. I mean, kids are so funny when they talk about them. It's just stupid. You just put it in stupid places. You know, I have to go all the way across this room. Right? So location placement is a, it, it's about convenience. We grow up and we get more and more convenience driven. So the location of bins and cafeterias or in the hallways or you know, you're trying to get them to go places. Or there's not enough at special events, so going to a football game or going to a concert or something that's there, and there's like you know two bins and they you know don't normally eat all those bins because it's only once a week. So how to manage the trash during the special event um, or, or whatever, and then it's just it's just dirty, it's just gross, and I'm like I won't touch it, I won't throw it away. So the gross factor, the convenience factor, and the uh, exposure are real big, and there was a lot of that sort of. Well, if, if they did this, then we'd care more. And, you know, I don't know how much that is true. But I think as adults and people who work with sites, we have that kind of responsibility to do that. Um, other insights on sort of more of the general information, they were aware of that most literary was harmful to the environment and the animals, but not sure how it got there. And again, these were like 11, 12-year-olds uh, in Pinellas County. They're not that far from the water. None of them are far from the water. So it's like, how does it get there? So this was, again, we, we ask questions without probing uh, or putting any kind of back information about environmental education in mind. We're just trying to get it. They're all very, very visually oriented. I think we are as humans. We wanted photos, they wanted posters, they wanted videos, but um, we got a lot of feedback that you know, they just get so depressed when they see like the animals and they're so sad and it's terrible. So if you don't, if you show them sad and terrible, you have to give them positive and action. So you can change this, you can stop this. Uh, I had in our summer camp program last year, one of the instructors said, yeah, I don't got really depressed, it's really cry. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> they gotta be inspired to go do something. Maybe a little weepy, then inspired. Um, they really do, as you know, want and, and enjoy experiential learning. And they like group activities. They even, like, even do cleanups if they're fun. And they get to go and play outdoors. Um, our, our Environmental Student Association on the US and Peak campus is now working with younger kids, and they were all out there the other day with trash nets and clippers, so it was quite exciting. I was like, are you sure they should be as water as this water? <laughs> anyway, so um, we're going to get into the aspect of developing messages, and there'll be time for some questions and interactive um, discussion and, and thinking about your own messages. So I wanted to give you some research and some examples of the difference between environmental information and, and education. And, and I think, the, by the way, the materials around here you know, are just phenomenal. Bath, whoever commented about the stuff in the bathroom was great. And I know many of you knew all this. And, and it was also reflected with the advertisement, as you saw on the campaign for the wellness. So, so the first one with this hotel science study was a group of um, uh, basically marketing persuasion specialists who really wanted to do a study to see um, how many people actually did reuse their towel. And they had a count going for using a sort of standard pro-environmental message here, you know, we've saved millions of water, blah, blah, blah. Then they switched it out, and they had two different messages. One that basically told people that um, people who stay here use uh, their, their towel more than once, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then the next level was in this room, and this people who have stayed in this very room have recycled or uh, reuse their towels. You see, that's just not even rational, but the general one was a 26% increase over the environmental line, and they're counting this by actual reuse of towels. And then the 33% was for that exact room. And they fully admit that there's no reason that that should be a good thing that people would want to follow the people who were there before them. But so the notion is for us, 
The people who have stood on this spot before and in this pavilion and at this shore have picked up their stuff and hauled it home and thanks for doing it too. You know, so the kind of way to provide aspirational role model and define a social norm for this space, I'm sure you can think of many, many ways to do it. I'm still so bad about it. So. Um, speaking of studies, Keep America Beautiful really has um, a great uh, trove of various uh, litter observations and behavior projects, which are also linked to uh, facilities and bins. So you can check that out on their website. Um, my favorite one, which was influential, was the study of hikers in a national park in Tasmania, again, where the uh, sort of uh, researchers, social researchers, tested this pers um, persuasion and applied behavior theories to say, hi, you know, help us keep the trail clean. Please pick up other people's litter. You know, so the notion of not just like, you know, you're good, you haul it out, but gosh, you know, can you help us do more? And the picking up litter theory, that it actually resulted in an increased litter pickup. I mean, so that that's a, really a step up, right? So it's not only are we not, we we're asking to just not litter, we're asking you to go get other people's trash. So I think that's a really good one, and, and I'm sure when we share this, you can um, get a link to that and ask your favorite university person if they will give you the free copy. So, so one of the big things, and it's also interesting with the kids, is that um, a lot of the research will tell you that most littering is accidental or inadvertent, not intentional. There's a small percentage of intentional litterers. And people are typically, it's either going to be a convenience issue or they're careless or not observant, sort of like, oh, I didn't realize I missed that thing. Um, so, you know, we can't assume that they're, they're you know, we can't assume the negatives, that they're lazy or stupid. The kids were phenomenally judgmental. It was hilarious. We said, why do you think people might litter? Because it's lazy. And we were all just full of vehemence and judgment about why people would do this. And we would say, hmm, and then later, because that's a problem. Because if we want them to have peer-to-peer -peer communications about other people littering, they can't be all harsh and judgmental. They have to find positive ways to reach their peers and of saying, you pig. So that was part of our exploration for where, you know, where do they come at it from an emotional judgment perspective. So in all these aspects, your talks, uh, your handouts, your signs, your sanitation plan for your spaces and facilities need to work together to encourage your visitors to behave in specific ways. Uh, influencing behavior. So between the verbal and written messages, we really need to be specific to the action required. Do you want them to haul it in and haul it out? Do you want them to drink fast now and dump it here before you go on? What is, you know, what is it specifically that you need or your space feels like it needs to reduce or prevent or change? It also needs to be positive. And this is a tricky thing because most of our stuff says, don't litter, don't do that. So trying to find a way to be creative and give them the instruction to say, hey, there's the bin, dump it in. You know, you got to really step back. And this was a tough one when we were asking kids to imagine how to give somebody positive tips. And I'm like, oh, please? If you say please, that just doesn't mean it's that positive. <laughs> it's nice, it's polite, but please doesn't make it positive. So, um, and again, in your messaging, you want to define the ideal social norm you want them to embody when they're in your space or in their home. Um, appealing to personal pride is, hey, so I was at Science Fest, I know you don't litter, but when you see your neighborhood, you can help your neighbors understand the importance of, you know, so it's like, hey, I want you to go talk about preventing litter in, in your area. So people are thinking about, I was there, I'm going to litter. You know, so that aspect of instilling and feel to pride and, and being a good role model. And humor can work. I mean, we, when I, I was back, I have like 20,000 years of social marketing experience, hardcore advertising, and all some other things. And, and humor is a really tricky, tricky thing. It either fails badly or it's okay. It's kind of neutral. But if you really do take a sort of friendly persona, um, you know, you're, you're, you have to know your audience and you have to be able to write your humor to that audience level and to what's funny. Um, sometimes crazy skits work, depends on the audience and how much time you have to build up the joke or whatever it is you're trying to do with them. So just Caution, um, you know, the use of graphics can be quite helpful in that regard. Um, as, as you saw from our focus groups and, and Keep America Beautiful's information, as well as some of the other behavior studies, really show that facilities have a great influence on behavior. Um, so the signage in the right location 
is going to be instrumental in setting the expectation for your behavior. So where are people, and, and what is it that you want them to do right now? Um, don't put the sign at the end of the trail if you need them to do something before. And so sanitation schedules, and particularly for me, is a very, very difficult uh, thing. I serve on the NOAA's uh, State of Florida Marine Debris Reduction Task Force, or for something other. We're trying to work on a statewide action plan dealing with the consumer debris part, which is both municipal um, and inland and inland trash. And we're talking about best beach management practices for bins. And a lot of people don't like to, a lot of people, Places don't like to use lids because they become some sort of environmental issue themselves. You've got wildlife, you've got lid issues, you've got trash issues, so it's a big balancing factor. And, and trash bins with lids also have factors of people not using them, you know, because I've got my hand and it's all gross. So I just threw up some ideas for, for bins, which are really common sense and probably widely available, but just to give an example of how this uh, ties together and that. They need to be conveniently located. Some of the Keep America Beautiful um, information basically says if it's more than like 30 feet away, people are likely to litter. That's an urban environment. Now, that's not a trail environment, but just to get a sense of thinking about your spaces. Smartly located. Fort DeSoto. Awesome. You know, one day I went there after uh, being gone for the winter, I came back. Well, wow. The bins are out by the parking. The bins used to be on the shore. I was like, yeah, who are you? Right. Because, you know, all right, well, maybe you have to pack it in and pack it out. I didn't, want, I didn't have to take it home. It was conveniently located next to my car. I just had to keep it secure when I was at the beach. And, you know, it was smelly. And I was like, oh, tie it up, put it back in the cooler. But the notion of where should it be to prevent what kind of littering problem? Is it wildlife? Is it... Um, disposal, and what I noticed is that the bins that they went from, they were small bins that required manual handling, that bigger bins were, uh, could use an automated truck, right, so the arms and that thing like that. So there was a, some thought given to it, and there were more bins at the parking space. So I thought there was a, you know, a strategic set of goals set aside for that time. And of course, clean, easy lids, um, empty before they get too full, otherwise you end up with that picture that you saw in the beginning, where people just stack things next to it instead of taking it home and have someone come and get it, not realizing the wildlife or wind or other things can get to it. So those were just uh, some of the key aspects of facilities. So um, we have 15 minutes to lunch or 17 minutes to lunch. So I wanted to ask you to um, put you through an exercise to think about your space. If you guys are working with people and you want to get together in, in some groups or you just want to um, think about your different uh, environmental uh, physical spaces that you'd like to do this for. Visualize your site and list the three most important points for the visitors. Now, you said well, this can be tricky, but it's the aspect of where, where people stop, where they engage, and before maybe where they get going into the environment or something along those lines. You can think of access points or visitor centers or bathrooms or whatever it might be. Make a list of the related social context for those sites. What are people doing? What's their sort of normal expectation for how much time do they spend there? How should they behave? Do they know? Um, and, and so literally, what, if you can identify these things. And so once you get those two or three two things done, then you just create a very short, specific, positive behavior litter prevention message. So imagine, when I say short, it could be eight words, three words. It's something that you would imagine if there was a sign at those access points and you wanted to get something aware. Just, just think of that. You don't like any of this, write your own stuff. <laughs> so um, why don't you take like seven minutes and just brainstorm by yourself or with others. Write some stuff down and then you, I'll ask you to uh, share your ideas. If you think you have something that might benefit some of your other um, colleagues here, that would be great. Okay? So. So, was it easy? Was it hard? Was it... No. It's not easy to be able to stack them together and come up with what are the right spots. It isn't. It is easy. There's actually a whole book or two devoted to understanding space, public spaces, and helping you to assess your use of public space. Actually, I'm going to click right to the next screen so you can see that book, um, but then you can actually get the information later. It's called Leisureology. 
I'm brand new, a couple months old, understanding literally and the secrets to clean public spaces. As a public behavior consultant who's been working in Australia for like 20 years with governments and Keep Australia Beautiful campaigns, and they just published this book. And uh, I, I met them uh, via Skype and their articles that they had written, and they're actually the campaigns for Australia are hilarious. They use a lot of um, sort of funny, profane humor, and they're um, stuff target beach goers. So fun stuff in that. Um, and they're quite candid about whether things work or don't work. So what else were some of the challenges you had thinking through that process? I feel like you might not actually know what your people think. That's sometimes a common issue. We have perception. We know what we think. But what is it a first-time visitor's experience or expectation? Um, what's a, an experienced visitor's expectation? So when you come to a place for the first time, you're like, what do I do? How do I act? Where do I go? Uh, I might not even go to a place if I think it's going to be too fearful. I, I say that, but like, you know, I, I go all over the world. But certain places, like nature places, scare me. You know, I'm like, I'm from Chicago. So if I haven't, something hasn't brought me there before, and I know how to act and where to go and where to get information, I might feel a little bit, a little bit of nervousness. So part of your greeting, part of your introducing new people to your spaces, can also help them incorporate all these other aspects of how to enjoy the space, how to take care of it, so you can keep enjoying it, and like others take care of it, so you can enjoy it. You know that sort of pure role modeling. Uh, yes. Besides just having a regular sign that just has words on it, and actually having a visual pictogram, so like, they name it, like, yes. like you know, the only be, the only button on your feet shouldn't be your own. languages, visuals that can reinforce the um, message you want to get across. I find a lot of the literary ones are fairly generic. It's going to be like, hey, put in the bin, you know, the, the, the humanoid character and that. So um, it's tricky. Not all uh, visuals translate, but sometimes can help people in terms of things like that. So what other aspects of the space um, if this was your place and you actually had to go and do this, what kind of team would you need to bring together to think through this process? Who would you want in there? The perpetrators. The perpetrators. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny answer. Okay. So, yes. Uh, the maintenance crews or whoever you're going to be tasking with cleaning it up after they put it in the can. Awesome answer. Maintenance crews. So people who've seen the experience, who know what goes on with those bins. Uh, we, we travel with St. Petersburg. I work with the stormwater, the guy who actually has to justify the money for massive catchment basins. And, and, and I said, well, how do you know what's going on out there? And he said, well, so-and-so is out there every day. He tells me, I said, let's go meet so-and-so. So we had a meeting with Sam. I said, Sam, where did you get this? Well, I, you know, I sent people out to do the cleanups. And the, you know, so we get closer and closer to the people who actually have to deal with the work. The people who are the ground people, who are just, you know, their cars driving around, they see the tourists, they see the visitors doing crazy stuff. Um, if you're in your leading, you're facilitating or creating your program, you may not see the day-to-day -day kind of insanity. So if you are going to do a site assessment, um, ask your people what are the crazy things they see, give them a checklist, and then tell them to keep a note, and then do something fun for them so that they come back with a list of, you know, well, maybe we should move that in from here to here. The good one in the school um, project was that the kids couldn't take food after a certain point. Um, and there was like a gate and some sort of barrier and this and that. But the trash bin was on the inside of the gate by the school door. But they couldn't bring that stuff in. So they were throwing crap on the outside by the gate. So that was one of the, the like, nobody ever looked at that. Well, uh, you know, it'd take more time. Or, you know, so you may have to work with people. So if you get, you know how it is, you get people's buy-in from the beginning. Oh. I didn't realize that the trash was piling up out there. Why is that? Wouldn't it be better to say you picking that up all the time that we put the trash bin out there? Well, somebody will steal that trash bin. I've heard this thing. Somebody will steal this trash bin. Somebody will steal this lid. Well, is it better to bring the trash bin out every morning and leave it there before the kids come into school and then haul it back? 
But it's not like they're one today, or maybe they come in twice a day, I don't know. So you have to think of your throughput, the flow of the tourists, the visitors, the, the whatever your process is. So it's who's in the process, where are the, the touch points that they can experience happy things, as well as making it so easy. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're not, humans are lazy, we're, we're convenient driven, so we're never going to be perfect. But if you can reduce the barriers, the good facilities design, great fun, smart signs, um, you know, and setting people's expectation for how to behave, then I think um, we'll go a long way to preventing um, litter in our aquatic and, and our preserves and our trails. So, any other thoughts you wanted to share with your colleagues? Because I think this is a great, great discussion, and I know you guys are all super, super dedicated. Or should we just call it lunch? Almost lunch. Almost lunch. <laughs> Well, there was that the one thing you just left in the corner. I, oh, I always like to ask you, what's the weirdest trash you've ever seen on a trail? Hmm. Oh. Mm, good idea. Well, this is a weird. We do a campus uh, trail cleanup a couple times a year at the university, and um, it's not the weirdest, but probably the saddest is the students um, get pets from the dorms and they get tired of them or whatever. And so um, we found a couple of um, small animal cages. We had a rabbit. The woman in the back corner mentioned she had um, found, uh, routinely finds dirty diapers in the trails of the trees, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to say something. Does the river count? Does it? Oh, yeah, right. Good river counts? Okay. Uh, what about toilets and bed pans? <laughs> oh, toilets and bed pans in the river. Gosh, I don't think that's going down the store drain. I don't think they're illegal. Don't, don't be. Yeah, I didn't even touch on that. That's a whole other day, another saga. Enforcement, consistent enforcement across boundaries is really an important thing for that. Or identifying um, people <laughs> see things at night and keep their eye on it, because that's usually when it happens when no one's around. So if you know that there's a site where there's routinely illegal dumping going on, um, put some friendly volunteers who so can. Uh, take pictures, document, not approach the illegal dumpers that we don't want them to get into trouble. Um, the craziest thing, I, I had, I talked to a lot of um, resource and trail managers before we did the grant, wrote the grant, I said, what is the weirdest stuff you've seen? And one of them said, ah, yeah, dog poo and plastic bags hanging in trees on trails. I was like, what? <laughs> and, you know, we're places where dogs are allowed to go, you know, you've got this nice, you're good, how is that possible? I mean, people, you know, and so I was relating the story to my really smart, really conscientious environmental science PhD uh, student who's our grad assistant on the project about different issues and behaviors and asking people who work in, in you know, special places, what do you see? And I said, and so and so saw this, and she was like, oh. I said, what? She's like, I've done that. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, oh, she, you know, I'm like, okay, don't she people. But I said, how did that happen? She said, well, my dog is just regular. And then, you know, it's always about a quarter mile into the trail, so I picked up, but it was really odd. And so I just thought, I'll hang it in the tree and come back for it. And then I lost it. I forgot where it was. And so the notion of even when people are smart, they want to do good stuff. So, but they're too important. So we hear people hanging dirty, nasty stuff in trees. And it's to keep it off the ground. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm sure you can find many, many fun stories to relate to other people. What not to do? Um, so thank you for your time and your attention. And I am um, very happy to uh, talk to you about your strategies or, or any questions about um, trash and different collaborations, so thank you.